On a summer's evening in 1953, a teenage girl was rushed to hospital. Her body was limp and showed no signs of life. It appeared the paramedics were too late. But although her body seemed lifeless, she was fully conscious and aware of everything. To her horror, she could even hear as they pronounced her dead. You know, you're alive, but then people taking you for dead, it's not funny. She finally came out of her paralysis to see dead bodies all around her. June Birchall has been pronounced dead not once, but three times. On two of those occasions, she woke up in a morgue. I'm not afraid of death, but I'm afraid of being buried alive. That's the point. June grew up in the south of England just after the war. She was in her late teens when she first experienced what must be everyone's worst nightmare. To be pronounced dead while she's still alive. It all began with an innocent night of entertainment at the cinema. This particular night I went to see a Bud Abbott and Lou Costello film, which at the time I thought was, was good, you know, they were good. Halfway through the film, June had a strange attack. I was laughing and I was laughing a little too much. June slid completely paralysed to the cinema floor. She was unable to move, but could hear and feel everything. I could still hear the film. <laughs> that was all right, but there wasn't anything I could do but just lay there. She was rushed to hospital, and then she heard the words that sent a chill down her spine. And they just left me with the sister, and it was her that examined me and then she went away, then she came back and she kept feeling me face. I thought, oh, feeling me face, well, to see if I'm still cold. And that's when she came back and she told the girls to prepare me for the morgue. While they were um, getting me ready for the morgue, I could hear everything I was saying. And they were talking about their boyfriends and... The other one was telling the other girl all that her boyfriend wanted her to do and should she do it and all this business, you know. And I'm, I'm saying to myself, no, you shouldn't do this, you know, you shouldn't do that. They took me down to the morgue and put me on the slab and left me. Lying in the morgue, June remained completely paralysed but fully conscious for several hours. That's when I started sort of fighting to get out of it. I'm getting out of this, you know, and I sort of wheeled myself out of it. And I looked around, you know, all these people that covered up, and I thought, gee, they are dead, but I'm not. I want to get out of here. <laughs> She sat up and saw a morgue attendant. And I went, <coughs> excuse me, can I go back to my ward? And he looks up and he just gave me one look and ran out of the morgue. <laughs> I never saw that attendant again. <laughs> I wonder if I gave him a heart attack. June tried to put this terrifying experience behind her and carry on with her life. But to her horror, one year later she collapsed again and was pronounced dead. Once more, she was sent to the morgue. I know, well, there's something about the second one that upsets me, I don't... No. And not only that, I mean, when you're putting them all dark, And I am scared of the dark, which have been. June emerged from her state of paralysis to find herself in the same nightmare situation all over again. She was locked inside the morgue for so long she lost all sense of time. But June believed she was there for at least three days until someone finally came to the door, allowing her to escape. 
The memories haunt June to this day. I don't like talking about that part, that one. Because it was a more frightening than a lot, and I just don't want to talk about it. Shortly after these attacks, June married and had three children. The family later moved to Melbourne, Australia, where she still lives today. But the attacks continued. Son Stephen watched her battle this strange condition with fear. She fought herself not to go into an attack. It's like the Hulk. If you've ever seen the Hulk, you know, he's fighting himself not to become the Hulk. And this is what mum is. It's like, I'm not going to become, I'm not going to go into the sleep. Because she knows that if she falls in a heap, she'll be not be carted off to the hospital. And might be an intern who, who's never come across it before. You know, next thing you know, he's signing the death certificate. That's what mum fights it for, because of that, that scenario. Unbelievably, this is exactly what would happen to June for a third terrifying time. June Birchall has been pronounced dead three times in her life. She suffers from a mysterious medical condition called cataplexy, a malfunction in her brain that causes her body to collapse to the ground in response to strong emotion. Her mind, however, is fully awake. I will fall if I'm standing, if they don't sort of catch me before. And uh, in that position, I will stay until somebody moves me. June can remain in this state for minutes, hours, or possibly days. She has one of the worst cases of cataplexy in the world. Cataplexy usually appears in people in their teenage years. Lissy Shepherd is 14 years old, and like June, has recently been diagnosed with cataplexy. It's really hard to know that eight months ago I was really normal when I was just the same as everyone else. And then all of a sudden it just feels like I woke up one morning and I was thrown with this. My brain can't control my body anymore and I'm trying to tell it to get up and it just can't. It's too tired to carry on. Just in the end it just collapses to the floor. Sorry, she's alright, Amy. No, she's fine. And during it I just can't move but I can hear everything that everyone's saying but it's, I can't move. Lissy has up to eight attacks a day, even more when she's tired, and they can last from seconds to hours. It starts, you can tell by her eyes. Um, are you fighting off something now? Not really. I think you are. Her eyes will become probably a lot more sort of fixed, um, and they will, they'll then become almost sort of glazed glaze over and she'll go very very quiet um, she'll still be sort of perhaps sitting up or, or standing and you can talk to her but there's, there's really no response and then sort of shortly after that is when she'll sort of drop to the floor but it's more it's the eyes really sort of um, tells us when a few minutes later Lissy has a cataplexy attack While the attacks themselves are frightening, what is worse is how strangers react to her when she has attacks in public. Some people even think she's dead. Oh, is she gone? Sometimes I just see lights and it's, it's normally basically just like black, it's just falling into a dream. I can, I can hear people's voices around, like, oh, what's going on? What's wrong with her? This man has just come out of the pub and he had, like, a cigarette and, like, he smelled, he was, smelled disgusting and it was, like, getting close to my face and, like, all the cigarette, like, ash was, like, falling on my face and it was horrible. And then, like, he, he, he was, like, hitting me in the face, like, wake up, wake up, little girl. And I was just, oh. My mum put her fingers in my mouth and was like, I'm going to make sure she hasn't swallowed her tongue, she's epilepsy. 
which isn't very nice. But most of the time my friends would deal with me like, yeah, she's fine, no, she doesn't need that, she'll come round in a minute. Some people think she's dead. She doesn't move. She looks dead. I sort of. Pale. People haven't, don't see it at all, do they? So, yeah, people don't see it. And they don't know what it is, so they first assume that she's dead. Lizzie's mother, Roxanne, is desperate for more information about her daughter's condition. Anything like I know about cataplexy is really what I've read on the, the internet and there seems to be sort of a bit a mix in terms of, you know, I think at one point it was thought to be hereditary, um, I don't think it is thought, thought that now. So there's all those sorts of things, you know, why all of a sudden that, that you were 13, weren't you? Yeah, at 13, perfectly normal, healthy, you know, why, why then? What's caused it, you know, what is the sort of malfunction, if you like, in the brain? Over two million people worldwide suffer from this mysterious condition that makes them suddenly become paralyzed and collapse while their mind remains fully alert. Andrea Scott is 33 and lives with her family in the north of England. She, too, had her first cataplexy attack when she was in her teens. When she was about 18, 19, something funny had set you off. Mm. Somebody would do something stupid or something daft, and that'd be it. Andrea would start laughing. And within a it few seconds, second, matter of seconds, yeah, literally, seconds, that was it. Was, yeah. You could see her eyes rolled back. Mm. And then, like I see at first, it was, it, was, it was funny because I thought, bloody hell, she's having a really good laugh here. And then... A body used to just sort of... Oh, yeah, completely just, just collapse. You know, it was weird watching it. <laughs> I was telling a silly joke and then I collapsed on my knees and I, I got a sense, I, I just got this, I, I felt myself dropping and it was like, I, I, my knees, it feels as if someone's getting a baseball bat and just whopping you behind your knees, you know, because your knees just go. And I felt it in the jerk a couple of times and I was still trying to get this gag out to my mum. <laughs> I was still trying to get the joke out, but I went down on the floor, and it, it's a concrete floor. When you collapse like that spontaneously, it's, that's something that does really scare you, like. Strangely, it's strong or spontaneous emotions that are the main trigger for people who experience these terrifying cataplexy attacks. Laughing is the main trigger with it. Um, um, fear, anxiety, stress, I can't argue with anybody. <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> I miss laughing. You know, I'm, I, I really do. I was always laughing in that. But if it's now, I miss, I miss that too. I've laughed to an extent, but not to the to a real good old laugh, no, I used to. You get to, you get to such a heightened state of, 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 your emotional state is so heightened that it's like, it just starts short-circuiting immediately, you know, it's like, it's as if the body, it's as if your mind's saying, I can't cope with this, closed down now and it systematically shuts everything off. It's a bit weird that I can't just sit down and like, cry like, not, not that I would without collapsing or someone can't jump up behind me without making me collapse or I couldn't like have an argument with someone without collapsing it's just I think that's weird if you explain that to someone they think well that's really strange for years researchers tried to study the brains of people during a cataplexy attack to see what was causing these strange collapses in response to emotion but with little success one of these researchers was Jerry Siegel, a world expert in narcolepsy and cataplexy. We were trying to do MRI scans during cataplexy and see what areas of the brain were activated and perhaps compare them across individuals. What, what turned out to be the problem, though, is that cataplexy is already an unusual event. You put people in an MRI scanner where <laughs> they're, uh, you know, 
in, in almost a barrel, and a very noisy one at that, where the magnets are going, making a lot of noise. And, and then you try and make them laugh to the extent that they had cataplexy. And we had uh, comedy albums that we were playing in their earphones. <laughs> and, you know, someone would be in there for an hour or two. They'd never laugh. And they said, yeah, that was funny, but, you know, not that funny. <laughs> While the study of cataplexy in humans remained elusive, scientists were undeterred and continued their research, sure that they would one day unravel its secrets. In the meantime, people with cataplexy have had to find ways of coping with it. People can learn to control their response to strong emotions, and in some cases can even fight off an attack. But this is usually only temporary. Sooner or later, their body will collapse beneath them. Roxanne! 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 It's just like going to sleep really, but not but being all awake and I can hear everyone like I heard you calling mum and I can feel my senses are still like there. I don't like it when, I, when I'm like paralysed, I don't know if that's part of the illness or not, I hate that. Because I'm so used to being normal and, and when you can't move you're just like, this is bad. And it's really horrible when you're trying to fight off an attack and you know it's going to happen but you're trying to stop it because it's like in certain situations it's like really not helpful. Most people have normal vital signs during a cataplexy attack and the attacks themselves are usually brief. Bring your head. <laughs> but for June, this is not always the case. When she has a severe and prolonged cataplexy attack, her blood pressure is abnormally low and she has shallow breathing, making it hard to determine if she's alive or dead. This is what June believes happened when she had her third major cataplexy attack in 1972. This time, the trigger was fear. I walked past the paddock and I looked in front and there was a snake crawling out of the, the fence, from the fence, and it crawled across the pathway and I watched it go down, un, down the curb and under one of them drain things. But just seeing the snake, that was it. I just froze on the spot. Her son, Stephen, was 16 at the time. Mum had one of her attacks and she's gone into uh, what we call a deep sleep, which is more like into a coma almost. The ambulance driver said, no, sorry lad, he said, there's nothing we can do. He said, she's passed away and that's it. He said, we have to take her. So he said, no, you don't. He said, you've got to leave her here. He said, we can't leave her here, son, she's dead. He said, but she's not dead, she's only asleep and he was Pleading and pleading, and all the way in the ambulance, he kept telling them, and they weren't taking no notice of it. And I, I'm holding her hand, and I'm just saying, Mum, come on, let's get there quick. You know, you'll be all right, Mum, you'll be all right. We're almost there. Virtual. We sort of got to the hospital, and the doctors basically said, I'm sorry, she's passed away. I was pretty hysterical and I was, I'm saying, no, she's not, she's got this condition and they sort of didn't even know what I was talking about. They thought I was just an hysterical kid who just lost his mum. I was trying to come out of this thing so I thought, myself, well, they don't hurry up, Steve's not going to stand a chance and now all these pleading weren't going to do any good. Despite Stephen's desperate pleas, the doctor pronounced her dead. He said to the nurse, just get her ready to take, take her down to the mortuary. I couldn't think of anything worse than being taken off to the hospital, knowing that you can hear everything's going on, you can hear the signs, you can hear the doctors all telling you, saying, I'm sorry, she's dead, uh, prepare for the mortuary. Being taken off to the mortuary and then waking up on, on a slab. 
added to her terror was the realization that in Australia, a morgue was a freezer. I thought, well, if it's cold enough, I'll be frozen if I... I won't be able to fight myself out of this because I'll be f***ing to death. <laughs> so I finally came out of it and I opened my eyes and Steve said to the doctor, he said, See, told ya, she's all right. All they did was assume and, and couldn't detect any life signs and assume that she was dead and that was it. So, yeah. Mistakes happen and it can cost somebody their life. June is now on medication for her cataplexy, but still has mild attacks to this day. She's arranged a visit to her consultant, Dr. Freilich, following a series of collapses only last week. Hello, come Hello. Mr. Birchall. Come through. Thank you. Mrs. Birchall's been my patient for nine years. I wouldn't see one new patient with this condition a year, and I see, I would imagine, several thousand new patients. Hello. So it's a rare condition, and she has a really severe manifestation of a rare condition. So it's, yeah, very rare. She's the only patient I've ever come across who's had the severity of cataplexy. How have you been? Okay, except on Wednesday I had a nasty attack at the hospital. You were at the hospital yeah, at the time? I was working at the time, yeah. She had been mistaken for being dead on, I think, three occasions, and that's most unusual. But the attacks are now controlled, and she has episodes, but they're infrequent, they're fairly brief, and she comes out of them quite quickly. And I felt it coming on, and, uh, and that's as far as I got. Yeah. yeah, they came, they called Code Blue, put me on the gurney, and took me down to emergency. Right. June often ends up in accident and emergency, following even her milder attacks. We rate level of consciousness on a very simple scale that just really records how much you are able to respond to the outside in movement, in eye opening, in verbal response. And when Mrs. Birchall came to us that day, she had the lowest rating possible. She was equal to a rock, basically. She wasn't responding to anything. Today, heart and brain monitors are used to determine if someone is alive or dead, even if they appear unresponsive. Someone who comes to emergency with an altered conscious state, such as she did, would automatically be put on an ECG monitor, have a 12-hour ECG done, so we would know that her heart was beating, even if she couldn't feel a pulse. Uh, simple technology could save mum from being put into a coffin or taken to the mortuary, and it is a heart monitor. As soon as she gets into the hospital, that's what they should do. Despite this new technology, June still fears she might have an attack that sends her once more to the morgue. But for Andrea, it's not the cataplexy she fears most, but the cause of her cataplexy. A medical disorder called narcolepsy, which has left her in terror of sleep. I, th I thought my mum was going to find us dead in my bed in the morning. Andrea Scott has narcolepsy, a medical disorder that causes a blurring of the lines between being awake and asleep. The strange collapses of cataplexy that she experiences are just one of its symptoms. But for Andrea, some of its other symptoms are far worse. Like the terrifying hallucinations that visit her in the night, leaving her in fear of her life. The first time it happened, I, w I was aware of the fact that I'd woken up and I felt fully alert as if I was, um, as if there was something, some kind of danger. My skin was covered in goosebumps. And sometimes I've actually had like hallucinations where it's actually been something has actually come into the room and physically sat on my chest, like little goblin things, horrible little things. really really scary I mean it sounds ridiculous but um, while it's happening to you you really do f fear for your life worse still when she wakes she often finds herself paralyzed I've tried opening my mouth to speak and um, making blood curdling noises to, that's alerted me mum and stuff like that but sometimes I can't make any noise I can't even open my mouth 
she showed for us in the best way she could. And he used to go in and she'd say, somebody's been pressing on my chest. I can feel somebody pressing on my chest and I can't, I can't get them off and I can't move. I thought I was um, cursed. <laughs> At first, I thought I thought to myself that this is um, my life's going to turn into one of those stories like the Amityville Horror or the Entity or something like that. I just didn't know what to think about that. I just didn't know what, but but it was obviously happening to her because you could tell by the genuine fear and terror in her voice and in her face and the shaking and everything. Like many children, Andrea had trouble with her sleep when she was a little girl. When I was small, I used to have nightmares. I used to be woken up in the middle of the night and something would frighten us awake and very strange things, which I'm sure would sound, sound as if I'm insane. But when she grew older, she began to find she couldn't stay awake, which is a classic symptom of narcolepsy. It was when I started falling asleep while I was doing things. Um, and I was about, I was just over 18 when that started and I would start falling asleep while I was walking and that was, that was when I really started getting concerned about it because I couldn't actually stop myself. I'm sure I must have looked like a drunk. It took five years for doctors to recognize what was wrong with her. She's now under the care of a sleep specialist, Dr. Paul Redding. Well, Andrew has the full syndrome of narcolepsy. She has uh, uncontrolled sleepiness during the day. She has cataplexy and her nocturnal sleep is also very disrupted, often with bizarre hallucinatory experiences. These symptoms are caused by the intrusion of rapid eye movement, or REM sleep, into wakefulness. REM is the stage of sleep where our brains are extremely active. We have vivid and often violent dreams, and our bodies are paralyzed to stop us acting out these dreams. In narcoleptics, this paralysis can happen while they're awake, causing cataplexy. And terrifying dreams can occur while they're partially awake, which can seem very real. Nightmares tend to occur in the middle of the night in uh, normal subjects, uh, as we wake up during an episode of REM sleep, uh, with a, a scary or bizarre image in our heads that soon fades away. In the narcoleptic, this image persists and can last for minutes, and patients often describe a difficulty in distinguishing these images or sounds from reality. I call him the shadow man because he's so frightening. Like, I can't actually give you a, a really... It's like his face is cloaked or um, under shades. It, it's too horrific for us to even want to know what's underneath it. Do you know what I mean? Sometimes he comes through the wall behind me bed. And um, when he comes in that way, he comes over the top of us and like spreads out over the top of us like that. He whispers in the ear. It's just pure terror, real. It's, it's like you, you feel as if your life is threatened, literally. Like most people with narcolepsy, Andrea is constantly exhausted and slips in and out of sleep day and night. I can sleep while I'm standing up. <laughs> I just sleep anywhere. Um, I can fall asleep while I'm eating and stuff like that. Um, it was very difficult getting, getting through college and stuff because I fell asleep quite frequently then. I'd fallen asleep one day during a lecture and I was still writing. <laughs> but I'd fallen, and my friends hadn't realised that I'd fallen asleep in the auditorium because my eyes were still open. So I was still writing. Part of us was still listening to me lecture. But um, I was alerted to the fact that I was asleep by an elephant walking down, <laughs> down the aisle of the auditorium. <laughs> and I thought, no, they don't allow ele elephants in, in, in the university campus, you know. So I, I kind of realised that I was asleep and then I woke up. Looked as if a spider had crawled across the page of my work, you know, because I'd, I'd carried on writing, you see. Like Andrea, June has narcolepsy. 
She first realized something was wrong with her sleep when she was in the British Army in the early 1950s, a year before she had her first major cataplexy attack. I kept falling asleep on my duty. I went to work and everything, and every now and again I'd nod off. After nine months in an army hospital, June was finally diagnosed with narcolepsy. She was told to avoid strong emotion in case this triggered a cataplexy attack and was prescribed stimulants to help keep her awake. I couldn't uh, be relied on, so I got medically discharged. It wasn't a very easy time after that, you know. To this day, patients are prescribed a cocktail of drugs to control the very worst symptoms. These include stimulants like dexamphetamines, more commonly known as speed. One of the things that it does, it makes you feel as if your mouth's just running away with yourself. I do, I'm, I talk to people and I feel as if I'm going... <laughs> it's like speeding everything up, do you know what I mean? Um, it's, um, that's, that's why they call it speed on the street, you know, um, because it does, it makes you, f sometimes it makes you feel, I'll say to me, mum, I've got two modes, fast forward and stop. She started on all this, this medication on these amphetamines, and when I, when I read the, um, the side effects, what could happen? I think that's the thing that frightened me more than anything else. It's, it's, it's the of, you know, that sort of upset me. It's the side effects of these, this medication that she's got to have for the rest of her life. People have said to us, um, oh, I wish I'd have some of them, them speed tablets that you take, you know, um, for that, I wish I had a bit of that narcolepsy like, you know, and, and I think to myself, you know, if I was sitting in a wheelchair, would you be saying to us, like, I wouldn't mind lending your wheels for a week, you know what I mean? <laughs> Give me legs a rest. <laughs> Even with high doses of amphetamines, Andrea still fades in and out of sleep whenever her mind is not stimulated. I don't live in the same time zone as everybody else. That's what I feel like. It, it, it knocks you out of sync in the respect that um, your reality becomes completely different to other people's reality. The combination of the symptoms and the side effects of the drugs has made it all but impossible for Andrea to live a normal life. It's a very, very hard thing to actually admit. It's like nearly admitting defeat. You know, I, I had to drop out of university, which was devastating to us. Especially considering that I'm like the first person in my family, in the immediate family, who, who'd actually gotten to university. And it's, it's really hard sort of saying, yeah, I can't cope with this. Because like, it's, it's like the mind's willing, but the body's not, you know what I mean? It's, it's very, very, it's very hard having to accept that in yourself as well. It's six months since Lissy, like Andrea, was diagnosed with the sleeping disorder narcolepsy. Her worst symptom is cataplexy. She still has several attacks a day and urgently needs to get them under control. At just 14, Lissy already worries about the impact this condition will have on her life. I'm scared that I'll hurt myself. I'm scared that I won't be able to be normal and I'll be, I won't be able to go to school normally. I won't be able to see my friends normally and I suppose I'm scared that people like see me as like a liability and get like sick of looking after me but like, I've always got people to assure me that never happened. Lissy, her mother and grandfather have come to London to see Lissy's consultant. Her attacks are still so frequent that she can't go anywhere without being chaperoned and the family are desperate for more help in treating her condition. All of us have got to the stage, we've had enough. We sort of can't carry on living like this. There's not one single day in 11 months where she hasn't had a, an episode of cataplexy. You know, we worked out over a thousand attacks, if you like. Um, an average school day, probably three, four times a day at school, and then of an evening, 
again varies, could be up to sort of six times that she'll just drop to the floor. So it is, you know, really difficult. None of the usual drugs can be used to control her attacks, as she's also been diagnosed with an unrelated heart condition. Hello. Hello. And, Hello. and that's Grandfather. Nice to meet you, Richard. Come in, please take the seat. My life, but to a much greater extent the life of my daughter and, and granddaughter has actually been turned on its head and there's been many crises or crisis after crisis she's collapsed she's fallen down the stairs in a cataplexy attack I, I, I accept there's no easy answer we need to monitor this I mean I think, I think this is not a simple case of narcolepsy there's a cardiac problem as well mm -hmm. and we need to tread carefully it doesn't mean we can't tread decisively Currently, the best doctors can do is try and control the very worst symptoms of narcolepsy, like cataplexy. But this could all be about to change. After years of research, scientists have made an extraordinary medical breakthrough that may transform the way this condition can be treated in the future. There's been an enormous change in how we view this disease from it being uh, uh, mysterious and, and maybe not, not quite legitimate disease to one that we have a pretty good understanding of and more importantly we have a very good idea of what the treatment is going to be. For years researchers have known that animals also suffered from narcolepsy and in particular from the symptom of cataplexy. That's cataplexy. But in dogs unlike humans it's a hereditary disease allowing researchers to breed and study them. In 1998, two different research teams discovered that a chemical called orexin, or hypocretin, was missing in the brains of narcoleptic animals, suggesting that this was the cause of the cataplexy attacks and other symptoms. Jerry Siegel and his colleagues then set about examining the donated brains of normal people and those with narcolepsy to see if this was the same in humans. Hypocretin is normally produced by cells in the hypothalamus, the brain's control center. But in people with narcolepsy, these cells have somehow been destroyed. The hypocretin is localized to a, a cluster of cells in the hypothalamus in all animals examined. So in normal humans, it's in pretty much the same place. But in narcoleptics, throughout this field, there's a loss of cells. As if someone just kind of went in with a pin and, and, and killed them one by one. There were many people who believed there was uh, a, a psychological illness, that it was uh, literally in your mind. And I think what we found here is that it's very clearly in your brain, not in your mind. It's thought that hypocretin works like a switch, controlling the transition from being awake to being asleep. Without it, people slip between different parts of sleep and wakefulness, including paralysis and dreams, just as happens with Andrea. You've got a light switch, you have it switched on during the day and you switch it off on a night time. But only with me, there's like a bit of a circuit breaker going on there, you know. I've got a bit of a malfunction going on. Um, and um, instead of it switching on during the day and then switching off on a night time, it switches itself off and on sporadically. But hypocretin has another fascinating role that may explain the mystery of why it is emotion that causes such problems for people and animals with this condition. In general, cataplexy happens during pleasant emotions. In humans, it happens during laughter most frequently. In dogs, it happens when they eat their favorite food or when they're, they're playing very actively. And these are the times when the hypocretin cells are normally firing at the highest rate. What Jerry and his team believe is that our bodies all experience weakness in response to strong emotion. This is exactly when hypocretin kicks in, turning on the chemicals that keep our muscles firm. So what we believe is that the hypocretin system has this role in maintaining motor activity during certain kinds of emotion. But in narcoleptics who don't have the cells or who don't have functioning hypocretin systems, whether animals or humans, the result is they tend to lose muscle tone and fall to the ground if they're standing up. Without hypocretin, we would all literally feel weak at the knees and collapse in response to emotion. 
This is an animal that's just spent its whole life knowing that when it gets excited, it lies down for a bit. Unlike a human narcoleptic, they don't have to contend with embarrassment or danger. They don't realize that there's anything abnormal with their lives. What scientists now need to find out is what is destroying these hypocretin cells in people's brains, causing narcolepsy and all of its devastating symptoms. Lissy Shepard is 14 and can have dramatic collapses at any given moment. Many scientists now believe that it's the loss of a chemical in the brain called hypocretin that causes these collapses and all the other symptoms of a condition called narcolepsy. But it's patients like Lissy who might be able to shed some light on what is going wrong in the brain. This type of sudden onset of narcolepsy, and particularly with the symptoms of cataplexy, these symptoms where you lose muscle tone and get weak, for it to occur so suddenly is quite rare. Lissy's cataplexy attacks, the worst symptom of her narcolepsy, appeared within hours of an immunization injection. I felt really <coughs> sick and lightheaded. And it wasn't like I normally feel, it was just, just really tired and exhausted and just needed to go to bed. And I was like, I remember sitting up right at the computer and then all of a sudden I just like fell to the floor. Now prior to that day, you've never had any weakness in your muscles at all? No. You had no symptoms of daytime sleepiness? Perhaps the, the vaccination you had or something occurred on that day. So there were some cells or some agent in our body that may have attacked those cells that produce hypocretin. This is a theory Jerry Siegel and his colleagues are currently exploring. We have reason to believe that at least some narcolepsy occurs uh, with a, an infection, a virus, or, or some sort of immune system activation occurring as an initial event. They found that in a number of brains donated by narcoleptics, there was clear evidence of infection and an autoimmune response in the hypothalamus, where hypocretin is normally produced. I think most people in the field now believe, and I certainly believe, that narcolepsy is an autoimmune disease that somehow causes the death of hypocretin cells and that, that the loss of hypocretin cells then cause all the symptoms of narcolepsy. If this is the case, the body's immune system is literally devouring its own brain cells. Nothing's going for you. Based on this theory, pioneering doctors like John Schneerson are experimenting with a new treatment which provides patients with donor immune agents or antibodies. His patient, Rebecca Farrant, is one of only a handful of people in the world to have this immune treatment. Every six weeks, she's given a three-day course of antibodies intravenously, which help to protect her hypocretin cells. I feel so different in myself. Yeah, that's great. Because <laughs> I was really depressed and everything before. I feel not bad to do nothing. This is her third course of treatment, and for Rebecca, it does seem to be working. Hopefully I can go to college or something and I feel like I can do that now um, before I, I couldn't do it. But I feel like I've got something to look forward to now. Scientists hope this cutting-edge treatment might one day be used in new patients to stop their body's immune system from destroying its own healthy hypocretin cells. This is the first real hope for a cure for this devastating condition. For patients whose hypocretin cells have already been destroyed, there is also hope. Scientists are working on developing a drug to replace the lost chemical hypocretin in the same way that insulin is replaced in diabetics. For Lissy, such treatments could transform her life. It would be such a relief to be able to get it treated or to be a bit better so I could just carry on as normal. It would make my life so much easier and it, would like, it wouldn't make it a struggle anymore. It would just mean that I could be back to normal again, like back to the way I was. Researchers hope that both of these treatments will be available in the next five to ten years.
But for June, this may be too late. And for her son Stephen, the worry remains that she will be pronounced dead again while she's still alive. Well, I've always said that if she has been pronounced dead, that she's not to be buried for at least a week because she could very well be in you know, a, a deep, deep sleep. When the day comes that she's truly dead and ends up in the morgue one final time, June hopes she'll be able to make a contribution to the continued medical research into this bizarre condition. They can take my brain for science and see what they can find out about what's what, you know. If my brain's any good and not addled and that, they can have it, do what they want to do with it. <laughs>